and good morning everyone. We're here to talk um, about education, which broadens the mind, or it's certainly supposed to. But some now argue that university education is doing the reverse. So first it was argued that the curriculum was dominated by a white male elite that was immune to criticism, and now others contend that there's a woke agenda of acceptable ideas which prevails, and that can't be challenged without risk to careers. Open debate, they argue, is out of the question. So should we insist on the goals of a plural space in which no one view is dominant and no group silences his or her opponent? Or is university inevitably a rite of passage in which uh, the received ideas are instilled in the current generation? At root is debate and freedom to express any opinion. Is it an essential part of a vibrant culture or an illusory ideal that's really a vehicle for privilege and prejudice? Well, to discuss this uh, contentious uh, topic, uh, we have a, a splendid panel. Uh, on my right, uh, Julie Bindle, who is a radical feminist writer, journalist, and author. She's also the co-founder of the Law Reform Group, Justice for Women, which since 1991 has helped women who've been sentenced for killing their violent male partners. Uh, on my immediate left is Loki, who's a UK-based rapper and political activist. He's written for The Guardian, of course. Uh, he's been interviewed by numerous media outlets, and his Oxford Union debate speech has been watched half a million times. On my far left, unusually, Peter Lilly, who's a British conservative politician. <laughs> he's a member of the House of Lords. He was a cabinet minister in the governments of Margaret Thatcher and John Major, and he's been a long-term critic of the European Union. Now, the first question that I'm going to ask people to address, and I'm going to begin with you, Julie, is education dependent on the notion that all views should be considered? Well, I'm not um, a proponent of blanket free speech. I think, for example, Holocaust denial should be criminalised. Um, and I think that we all have our line in the sand. So for me, it's not about enabling, for example, a highly privileged uh, white male racist sexists to be able to come up with any old dribble that they wish. I think we should have proper discussions about curriculum and about the way that white elite men still um, dominate universities, but now they present as progressive as opposed to just being proudly right wing or traditional. For me, this is about class. So when I go to universities, the times I'm allowed in there, of course, um, and do talks to students, I notice that there are barely any working class students anymore at all. So universities have now become just holding pens for the elite, where the kind of discussion that you might want to have in order to reach a conclusion is not allowed because the young people that populate our universities in the main, not all, but in the main, are so certain of their views that what they want is constant validation. They want total capitulation to their own views. And as they've often told me and other colleagues, they don't want to be triggered or traumatized when we talk about things as mundane as rape domestic violence and who is responsible, femicide, and for example, that the women that populate the sex industry, that they will insist on referring to as sex work, while still claiming to be on the left and to be progressive, when what we have is evidence that those women and girls in the main that populate the global sex trade are the most disenfranchised imaginable. So I find that there is a resistance to ideas that challenge not only their orthodoxies, but also their innate sense of entitlement and privilege. And until we have a proper mix in our education system, in our higher education system, class-wise, in particular, I think, right now, then this isn't going to change. Thank you. Um, look, I'm going to go straight on and just ask you to address the same question. So I would like to start by quoting someone who 
you know, if anyone saw the debate that I had with Slavoj Žižek, you would see that I don't agree with him on a whole lot. However, he put it this way, the most dangerous form of non-freedom is a non-freedom which is not perceived as such. Now, it's my conviction that we have a carefully cultivated hierarchy of political subjectivity in this country and that that cultivation has taken place with the complicity of a member of this panel. I will explain how. If I were to tell you, if I were to tell you that when the National Union of Students came up with the no platform policy, it was to stop speakers from apartheid South Africa coming and saying what they wanted. At that very time, the conservative government were cooperating with the apartheid government, despite the fact that boss agents from apartheid South Africa placed bombs at three locations in London targeting anti-apartheid campaigners. So when the NUS came out with this no platform policy, what do you think happened to the NUS? Well, they were infiltrated by a spy cop who goes by the name of Peter Francis. So the question has to be very clear here. Who have been the main agents and forces of unfreedom in this country and cultivated that lack of political subjectivity, especially when it comes to the education sector. What we're talking about is a marriage between the state and corporate interests to blacklist and censor people that speak against certain things within the workplace. You're talking about 3,000 construction workers who were blacklisted by an organization that had direct cooperation with Special Branch. And in case you're wondering how far up the train this went, Norman Tebbit, who was employment minister at the time in the Thatcher government, said he was being briefed on where trade union leaders went on holiday. So it's not something that others on this panel had no relation to at all. Then we talk about prevent. The Equalities Act in 2010 clearly says that you in the public sector have no right to discriminate against somebody for their religious or political views. What PREVENT actually explicitly expects from people is them to carefully surveil Muslim students for things like signs of depression, going through changes in their life, students who speak more than usual, students who speak less than usual. The youngest child referred to the channel program is three years old, okay? You are talking about prevent opening up the space for Muslim children to be questioned by police without the foreknowledge of their parents. That is the kind of society that we have today and it has been formed very carefully over many years. So what I'm saying, just to finish, is we also have a government that is banning anti-capitalist texts in schools. This is not a free society and it is absolutely clear to say that in this carefully cultivated space of, uh, of a hierarchy of political subjectivity that some forms of censorship seem to be more visible and louder than others. Thank you. Peter, <laughs> Peter you're, you're looking rather thoughtful, um, uh, and um, could I invite you to address the opening question, about, which I, to, just to remind everyone, was whether all views should be considered in education. Well, they should, uh, even low keys, um, though I hadn't realized I was guilty of all these things until I heard it from him, or indeed that I had any involvement in any of that. But now, I... Uh, was, uh, went to a school where we had to specialize. At the age of 12, I specialized in science and continued to do that through until I graduated in science. So I have only experienced, or I subsequently did a crash course in economics, but primarily my educational experience is of teaching of science. And in science, every view does have to be considered. So the answer to the question is yes. Uh, and any view can be challenged, and any alternative view can be put forward. And that can be challenged. The test always is the facts. Professor Feynman, a great physicist of the last century, said, it doesn't matter who invented a theory, how elegant that theory is, and he didn't add, but one could add, it didn't matter whether the inventor of that theory was a Jew or a Muslim, a conservative or labor. What matters is do, observation, do uh, predictions based on that theory conform with the facts? If they don't, the theory is wrong. 
It's as simple as that. Now, teaching in the humanities is diff different, I, I grant you, it's not as simple as that. But ultimately, the test should be facts. It's not the authority of person who puts forward a thesis, it's not even whether they're a nice person. Uh, Einstein was pretty deplorable and patriarchal and whatnot towards his wife and women in his life. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the theory of relativity is wrong. That is tested by the facts. Whatever we say should be tested against the facts. What Loki says should be tested against the facts. If he thinks that I was uh, briefed in some way about all these things, um, well, uh, well, you were fine. part of a government that did that. Loki, I mean, Loki, I, okay, Loki, no, that's Loki, not Loki, no, I was. Please, no one interrupted you, Loki. No, no, it's fair enough. It is a fact. I was part of the government which allegedly, allegedly did things. But you not said allegedly. allegedly. Not allegedly. Uh, uh, the Spy Corps inquiry has laid it out for everyone well, to see. Uh, uh, it's not an it's allegedly. Allegedly doesn't mean it's false. It means it's alleged. I haven't seen that evidence, but I'm prepared to accept it if I see the evidence. I'm interested in objective fact. I'm not interested in guilt by association, which seems to be your prerequisite. Uh, so I rest my case. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.